We began the French festival two weeks ago amidst a blizzard. This afternoon, I found the first aconite blooming in our garden. If this flower were a prize, and if the French festival were a popularity contest, the winner of this flower would be, any guesses? I think Camille Saint-Saëns. He's had one program all to himself in the first week. He's been a headliner in the second week. And he's making two cameo appearances in the third week. Some guys have all the luck. Joining Saint-Saëns on tonight's program will be one of the most famous French composers, Claude Debussy, and one of the least famous French composers, Henri Rabot. When it comes to Debussy, you may be thinking, it's about time this guy showed up. When it comes to Rabot, you're probably thinking, who? Taking the music, uh, as I generally do in chronological order, we start with Saint-Saëns' third violin concerto, opus 61, composed and published in 1880. 1880. Ten years past the Franco-Prussian War, Saint-Saëns is still head of the Société Nationale, and any instrumental virtuoso in Europe would have been pleased to have a concerto of his to play. But Pablo de Sarasate wasn't just any virtuoso. Born 1844 in Pamplona, no racing bulls for him, I hope, Sarasate was by 1880 an internationally celebrated concert artist, having toured North and South America and every country in Europe. Even the Germans loved him although they usually insisted that Josef Joachim gave a more probing account of Beethoven's violin concerto. Composers, Joachim among them, were eager to write for Sarasate. Saint-Saëns dedicated not only his third violin concerto to him, but also his first violin concerto and his introduction and rondo capriccioso, which we'll hear tomorrow night. Although Sarasate was Spanish by birth, perhaps even Basque by birth, his training was Parisian. Thanks to a scholarship from the Queen of Spain, he was a prize-winning student at the Conservatoire, not just in violin playing, but in solfege and harmony as well. Back in Mozart's and Beethoven's day, the protocol in concertos was for the soloist to wait until the orchestra had presented the main themes before entering and taking possession of the material, so to speak. Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto and Schumann's Piano Concerto had changed all that in the early 1840s by ushering in the soloist right away. That is Saint-Saëns' procedure, too, in this work. If you like to listen for melodic connections, focus on the very first four notes the violinist plays. Da, 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 da. You're going to hear a lot of those. Uh, you'll hear them all over the place in the first movement, like a red thread of continuity. Most often they're in the solo part at varying rates of speed, but in two really cool passages they're plucked in the string section while the violinist is playing something completely different, something stratospherically lyrical. After the storm and stress of the first movement in B minor, the middle movement in B flat major seems as gentle as a lullaby. But second movements seldom have the last word. The third movement takes us right back to B minor, via an exchange between solo and orchestra that may strike some of you as a particularly stormy recitative in an opera. If you're waiting for the music 
And when, when things start in the minor mode, we sort of hope that there's going to be a happy ending, right? That they're going to end in the major mode. So if you're waiting for that, here's a tip. Just wait for the brass chorale in the finale. After that, it's clear sailing. Now we come to the 600-pound gorilla in the room, Claude Debussy. It's fair to speak of his music as epic-making. He was a near contemporary of Gustav Mahler, but Mahler seems to culminate a tradition, whereas Debussy quite simply reinvented the language of Western music. Like Mahler, he received a conservatory education, specializing in piano and composition. Unlike Mahler, Debussy rebelled against his conservatory training, although not violently enough to prevent his being awarded the Prix de Rome, which got him two years of study in Italy. Once he returned to Paris in 1887, Debussy fell in with the symbolist poets who haunted the cabarets of Montmartre and adored Wagner. More about the symbolists in a moment. It was perhaps under their influence that he made the pilgrimage to Bayreuth twice. By the early 1890s, Debussy was over Wagner and ready to strike out on his own creative path. He stepped back from Wagnerian grandiosity, finding nuances at the quieter end of the expressive scale seemed to him preferable to achieving ever louder sonorities or ever loftier philosophical ambitions. Debussy found other ways around conventional tonality than by simply increasing the quotient of chromaticism. He found different scales to work with, scales that eliminated the old contrast between major and minor and wiped out the traditional harmonic formulas for marking the end of a musical phrase. As a result, and I don't want to get technical here, but as a result, Debussy completely altered our sense of musical goal orientation. We don't hear the music striving toward a predictable destination anymore. We simply relish the moment we are given. In many respects, Debussy's breakthrough work was the prelude to the afternoon of a faun, prelude à l'après-midi d'un faun. The title takes some disentangling, so let's proceed backwards from the end of it. First of all, what is a fawn? Not Bambi, but that ancient Roman deity of forest and field, usually portrayed as half man and half goat, or at least as a man with the pointy ears and uh, forehead horns of a goat, and usually credited with an insatiable appetite for amour. What is the afternoon of a fawn? It's a poem by Stéphane Mallarmé. Mallarmé hoped the first version, finished when he was 23, might be presented on stage, an idea clearly ahead of its time, given the subject matter. The final version of the poem was finished in 1876 and was published as Mallarmé's first book. It helped establish him as a leading figure amongst the most progressive poets in France. The label attached to this poetic movement is symbolist. Symbolist poets were much preoccupied with interior landscapes, dreams, and rarefied psychological states, but not with narrative logic. They valued the musical qualities of language over the rational meanings of words. Mallarmé was downright arcane in his word choices and his manipulations of syntax. A couple summers ago, as a self-imposed exercise, I translated 
the afternoon of a fawn into English, and it was a tough slog. In 1892, Debussy asked permission to write music to accompany a public reading of the poem. For a while, Debussy contemplated not just a prelude, but also interludes and a final paraphrase, as he called it. A piano version of just the prelude was completed in early September 1893, and Debussy much later recalled the afternoon that he played this for Malarmé. I translate from Debussy's words. After having listened, he was silent for a long time. And then he said to me, I was not expecting anything of this kind. This music prolongs the emotion of my poem and sets its scene more vividly than color. So Debussy stopped while he was ahead. He never composed anything more than the prelude. So, are there children here? Oh, okay. What's this fawn doing with his afternoon? Trying to hold on to an, an erotic dream. Or, or was it a dream? His mind goes back and forth over the details of his encounter, real or imagined, with two sisters whom he has surprised in slumber, until he finally erases all memory by drinking himself to sleep in the heat of a summer's day. Something we've never done, right, Trevor? Characteristically, the flute solo that you hear at the very beginning is prompted by an image in the middle of Mallarmé's poem. Narrative logic, eh, who needs it? And the first harmony you hear after that flute solo is a version of the so-called Tristan chord, a harmonic leitmotif from Wagner's famous opera that, for musicians of Debussy's generation, symbolized desire. I'll let you figure out the rest from the music. Henri Rabot is the composer in this bunch who is likely to be least familiar. That wasn't necessarily so in his lifetime, but it is so much the case today that between the secondary sources that give 1899 as the year of composition for Procession Nocturne and those that give 1910, I could not ascertain which was correct until I found an authoritative catalog in our music library, 1899 is the correct year, not 1910. Rabot was born into a musical family. His father taught cello at the Paris Conservatoire. He studied composition at the Conservatoire and in 1894 earned the same crowning distinction that Debussy had, but which was denied Ravel, namely the Prix de Rome. Then he too made the pilgrimage to Bayreuth in order to experience Wagner's masterworks in their natural habitat. He enjoyed professional success as a conductor at the Paris Opera from 1908 and spent a season with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, succeeding Karl Muck in 1918. The breakthrough as a composer came with the opera Marouf Savetier de Caire, Shoemaker of Cairo, which was performed at the Opéra Comique over 120 times and spread to opera houses all throughout Europe. Perhaps in recognition of this achievement, he was elected to the Institut de France, the French Institute, in 1918. And then, in 1920, he crossed over into what we in academe call the darker side, administration by succeeding Gabriel Fauré as director of the Conservatoire. He reached the regular retirement age in 1941, the year before France had fallen to the German juggernaut, to the, Nazi, to the army of Nazi Germany. And in his official position, 
Rabot was placed into some difficult ethical situations. My colleague Jane Fulcher has done the fundamental archival work on musical life in France during the Vichy regime. And she was generous enough to send me last week her proofs, the, the proofs of her forthcoming book on this subject. From her book, I gather that Rabot tried unsuccessfully to shield a Jewish piano professor from Nazi persecution and that when ordered to account for the racial profiles of all students at the Conservatoire, he dragged his feet until his retirement. Unfortunately, one of his underlings did the Nazis' bidding more eagerly. In artistic terms, Rabot did not seem to think the German juggernaut a problem, at least not in 1899. He based this symphonic poem on an episode from Faust. Not to drag you all back into lit class, but Faust was a legendary German, well, in some accounts, charlatan, let's put it more mildly, striver after arcane knowledge, who at a given juncture sold his soul to Mephistopheles, that's a $4 word for the devil, and seduced an innocent girl. The legend inspired a tragedy by the English dramatist Christopher Marlowe, a monumental drama by the German cultural hero Goethe, or Goethe as we pronounce it in Chicago, and a series of lyric poems by the German writer Nikolaus Lenau. Lenau was the quintessential romantic, unquiet soul, undecided between law and medicine as professions, inclined toward melancholy either way, until, luckily, an inheritance allowed him to devote himself full-time to writing poetry. In 1932, this unquiet soul even tried immigration to the U.S., settling in Ohio and Indiana in turn. He clearly chose the wrong states, because by 1833, he was back in Europe. He published his Faust poems in 1836. Sadly, in the mid-1840s, Lenau showed signs of mental instability, and he spent the rest of his fairly short life in an asylum. Many musicians have been inspired by Lenau's Faust. Franz Liszt translated one scene into four Mephisto waltzes. Henri Rabot translated the episode titled Der Nächtliche Zug, The Nighttime Procession, into the orchestral work that opens tonight's program. This poem is translated into French prose on the first page of Rabot's score. The events can be summarized thus. On a dark night, a forest seems to be animated by harbingers of spring. Faust enters the woods on horseback, absorbed in his own gloomy thoughts. Suddenly, there's a glow amidst the trees, a solemn procession of children carrying torches, two by two, followed by veiled virgins who are followed in turn by old monks, their hair colored by the morning frost of eternity. It is the Feast of St. John, the shortest night of the year. And the procession is singing, the thin children's voices blending with the deep voices of the monks. Faust watches until the procession trails off into the distance, envying their happiness. When they are gone, he weeps bitter tears into the mane of his horse. Now, all of this is pretty clear in the music. There's even a special tune for the procession. Uh, dum, da, 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 dum, da, 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 dum, or something reasonably like that. Uh, and we hear clearly the approach and the recession into the distance. My favorite passage in this work is the changeover from the procession music, which is all in C major, pure as can be, back to the music projecting the psychological turmoil of Faust. But then, the music goes further than Lenau's poem does. It adds a calm ending in the major mode, as if the composer were somehow 
seeing past Faust's bitter tears to something else. Debussy never came closer to composing a symphony than he did with La Mer. He started it in August 1903 and finished it within two years. While working on it, <clears throat> he left his wife and eloped to the island of Jersey with Emma Bardock, who was married to a wealthy banker but had been having an affair with the composer Gabriel Fauré. What complicated lives these French composers led. La Mer comprises three movements, or as Debussy called them, three sketches, each one with a programmatic title. One, from dawn to midday on the sea, two, play of waves, or perhaps better, wave games, and three, dialogue of wind and sea. In all three sketches, we can sense time passing. In the first and third sketches, there is a climax toward the end. We can't say anything more specific about what happens. The sea is what happens. We might focus, and a conductor surely has to focus, on each detail that each instrumental line contributes to each sketch. But you'll all be better served if I simply tell you that everything DBC really wants us to notice, he repeats immediately. La Mer is one of the works that uh, has most often invited comparison with Impressionist painting. But Debussy was first to insist that when it comes to depictions of nature, music has this over painting. It can centralize variations of color and light within a single picture, a truth generally ignored, obvious as it is. In other words, music registers changes in real time. We don't get snapshots, we get videos. As you listen, try to follow the advice of the critic who witnessed the American premiere of La Mer in 1907, 110 years ago. It would be impossible to give any analysis of any movement, for they are as shifting and capricious as the sea itself. The hearer must cast aside all theories about how music should be written. And for such music, I'm happy to do so. Enjoy the show.